Improvised explosive devices, there's no set standard on how that's going to look. So every time we encounter a device, it's different. And we have to take all the precautions necessary to protect ourselves. Fire in the hole! My name is John Stewart. I'm a FBI agent. I'm the unit chief of the Hazardous Devices School. I started off in the United States Navy. I was an enlisted EOD tech for 12 years and then was hired as an FBI agent. My primary mission was to provide support to our state and local bomb technicians. I've responded to a number of calls. Those calls resulted in the discovery of military ordnance, hand grenades, improvised explosive laboratories where people are making homemade explosives. Those calls resulted in us disrupting pipe bombs. If they needed me to dress out in a bomb suit and go down range, I'm trained and capable to do that. If they need me for post-blast experience to help them collect evidence, we're there to help them do that because that all falls in the category of bomb technician responsibilities. I've worked a number of cases on the international terrorism side. I spent approximately two years in Afghanistan working as an FBI bomb technician conducting post-blast analysis and analysis of IEDs for the U.S. government. So if something blew up out in town, we would go out and do a post-blast investigation, recover all the components we could find, bring that back into a controlled environment, and then try to recreate and determine exactly how that IED functioned. And then I was able to come to the Hazardous Devices School and become a certified public safety bomb technician. IED means improvised explosive device. By the mere term, it's improvised and they come in all shapes and forms. They have to have some type of power supply or some type of way to get heat into the explosives. They have to have some type of switch. They have to have some type of container and they have to have conductors and wires and things like that. When you take an x-ray of an IED, you're looking for the key components. You're looking for the explosive charge, you're looking for the switch, and you're looking for battery power to determine whether it's an IED or not. There are two different types of explosives. There are high explosives and low explosives, and those really are based on the deflagration or burn rate or the ability for the explosives to change from a solid to a gaseous state. Low explosives burn or deflagrate, and high explosives change from solid to a gas in microseconds. When we're dealing with IEDs, some can be a low explosive or a powder, some can be high explosives. Military ordnance uses high explosives inside of it. Low explosives are typically seen in some type of contained vessel like a pipe bomb, a pressure cooker. The pressure cooker is a standard pressure cooker that holds pressure, has a low explosive in it that burns, and as it burns, the pressure cooker contains the low explosive buildup until it can't contain it anymore, and then it overcomes the pressure cooker and explodes. It's a mechanical explosion. As you know, the Boston bombing, they used pressure cookers in there. Everyone who was able to watch that on TV and see it through news reports witnessed what happened. So we had several bombs that blew up uh, on the streets of Boston. Following that event, there was an evacuation that occurred. They removed the wounded. The bomb technicians then have to go in and do some threat assessment and analyze everything left to determine whether there's any more bombs in the area. As you can imagine, there are backpacks and boxes all over the street, and so they have to go and threat assess their way through all of those packages to determine if there's any more bombs that pose a potential danger for the public. We categorize IEDs into three different categories. We have victim initiated, which means the victim has to do something to make it go off. We have timed, which means in a certain amount of time it's gonna detonate, and then we have radio control or remote control, which means someone else is controlling when that device is going to detonate. An improvised explosive device presents a number of personal injury issues. Of course, there's a fragmentation issue that comes with it. The fragmentation is going to break windows, it's going to penetrate skin, it's going to hurt people, it's going to destroy property. Every explosion carries a thermal effect, so like a heat wave or a heat ball or a fireball that comes off, there's a potential for things to catch on fire and burn because of the fireball that comes off of that explosive. And then there's what we refer to as the blast wave. It's the invisible wave of pressure that flies out. 
the blast pressure affects glass, it affects eardrums, internal organs, and things like that. But we have calculations that we use to determine how far to evacuate people to help us provide better protection from fragmentation and overpressure. The Hazardous Devices School curriculum was originally developed by the Department of the Army. We took the tactics, techniques, and procedures that the military would teach in their bomb techs when they were dealing with IEDs, and we used that same information to develop our original curriculum back in 1971. The Vietnam War was drawing down, and bomb technicians from the Vietnam War were coming back, going to work for police departments, and performing bomb tech activities. This school is designed to train public safety law enforcement who have no information about bombs, all the techniques, tactics, and procedures to be deployed and used when they're working on suspicious devices. During training, there are a number of key areas we like bomb techs to leave here with. I think the most important one is their ability to conduct a threat assessment. To look at something and to try to determine in their mind why it's there and what's potentially gonna cause it to go off. You have to know electronics, so when you're analyzing your x-rays and you see certain things in the x-ray, you have to be able to determine what they are. You have to know how to run a robot just in case you can do it remotely. You have to know how to use explosives because a lot of the tools they use in the field are explosively driven tools. So you have to know how to safely handle explosives to load those tools and place them and fire them. Bomb squads across America receive bomb calls all the time. Once their dispatch receives a call, they make a notification to the bomb squad. The bomb squad then goes to the scene. Once there, they meet with an on-scene commander or the individual in charge, and they try to gather some intelligence. What is it? Where is it? How did it get there? How long has it been there? All of those questions are asked. Another big important part is, is there an evacuation that has occurred? Have we moved all the people out far enough so if this thing were to detonate before we made it downrange, they wouldn't be hurt? Once all of that is taking place, there's a determination, do we do this remotely with robots or do we have to put someone in the bomb suit? If we can perform all the actions we need with a robot, it's sent downrange to perform x-rays. They can fire tools off of the robot. They can do a number of things that prevents a bomb technician from having to get into a bomb suit and actually going downrange. But on occasion, there are times when the robot will not work. Depending on where the device is at, depending on the complex situation we have, there's potential for the bomb technician to actually have to get in a bomb suit and go down and do the initial work, make an assessment of the device, perform passive diagnostics, take x-rays, and then place a disruption tool. Once that's done, everybody falls back to a safe area and they perform an action to disrupt that package. So the process of putting the bomb technician in the bomb suit is fairly easy, but it takes a number of people to do it. So right now they're putting on the trousers. The trousers are Kevlar and Nomex, and they provide protection to the lower extremities. There's also a back protector that provides very limited protection to your back. So after the trousers are on, the bomb technicians will affix the integrated groin protector, and that provides limited thermal protection and ballistic protection to the growing area. He's now putting on a balaclava. That helps provide protection to the helmet and absorb the sweat as the bomb technician is performing his duties. The next piece of equipment that will go on the bomb technician is the helmet. That's the EOD-9 helmet. That's a visor that moves up and down. So when the bomb tech is downrange next to the device, he would have the visor pulled down. The next piece of equipment they'll put on is the jacket. It is a Nomex Kevlar makeup. The big black plate you see on the front is a Kevlar shield that provides maximum protection from fragmentation to the vital organ area. They then tighten Velcro around the wrist of the jacket, providing the bomb technician dexterity with his fingers while he's working. On the left side, you will see a control panel. That control panel controls the fan inside of the helmet to help control body temperature. It also helps the shield from fogging up and there's lights on the helmet that the bomb tech, if desired, can turn on. Right now, they're gonna raise the collar up, providing protection for the neck area between the gap where the helmet and the jacket meet. So you'll notice that the hands are not covered. 
That's for maximum dexterity. The bomb tech needs to be able to work with tools, and if you put gloves on them, it restricts his ability to use his fingers and hands. Once the bomb squad arrives on scene and they collect their intelligence, they have to determine what type of approach they make. If they determine that they have to put a bomb technician down for time on target, there's a couple things that they need to do. So they'll dress the bomb technician out in the bomb suit, and then they want to walk down range and conduct a threat assessment and some diagnostics of that package. One way they conduct diagnostics is through their vision. What is it? Where is it at? And why is it setting where it's setting? Next thing they would do is take an x-ray of the package. This machine generates x-rays that run through the package and presents an image on a phosphorus panel. The bomb tech would put the phosphorus panel behind the suspect package and then generate some pulses with this to get an x-ray. They'll also bring down some tools to do some work because we like to minimize time on target. That's time that a person is standing next to the device. And they'll place those after they perform their x-ray for a standard general purpose shot. They'll go back and develop the x-ray, and if the x-ray is determined that it is an actual device, they will fire those tools without ever having to approach the device again. This is a pan disruptor, very common in the bomb technician world. It's a percussion actuated, non-electrically fired device. The pan disruptor is a steel tube that uses shotgun cartridges. We'll fill this tube full of water. We'll plug it on the end. We'll put a blank shotgun shell into the end of it. And then we use what is called a breech that has a firing pin that is then projected forward by an explosively driven shock wave from shock two. That way we can fire that remotely and the bomb technician doesn't have to be anywhere around the package. Another tool that's very common is a mineral water bottle. On the interior of this bottle is a plastic tube that's filled with C4 explosives. This is an omnidirectional tool, so when you detonate the C4, that water is going to strike the package and hopefully disrupt the suspect package that we're working on. This can be fired a number of different ways, but typically it's fired with a Primadet with non-electric shock tube. A Primadet is nothing more than a non-electric type blasting cap that is hooked to shock tube and there's basically an explosive wave that goes down and initiates the explosives in the tube. One of the tools available to the bomb technician is a hydrojet. This is a 32 ounce hydrojet. It's a directional charge, which means it's filled with water. This plastic sheet inside is formed to make a V. You would take data sheet or sheet explosives and affix it to this V. It then goes back into the hydrojet that is full of water and it's fired with a Primadet. Once it's fired, the projection of the explosives drives the water into a knife and cuts through suspect packages. Since the inception of the curriculum, there's been a lot of change in the bomb tech community. Explosives are still the same, IEDs, the devices that we deal with, but of course with computers and being able to get online and research, the sophistication of those have, have risen. Most importantly is our tools that we use to do diagnostics and disrupt IEDs have increased dramatically. Our x-ray systems are some of the best in the world. Our disruption tools are some of the best in the world. And they're all designed to provide more protection for the bomb tech while he's performing those duties, which in turn provides more protection for our public. Typically, procedures that are trained here at the Hazardous Devices School are employed out in our cities and states across America. It happens often where bomb squads are notified of suspicious packages. That happens across America every day. There's no playbook that says, if it's this, do this, or if it's that, do that. We have to use the tools and techniques that we're taught. We have to use a good threat assessment, and we have to work our way through every single problem we encounter.